Welcome to Rainbow Soul, part of the WLFE DB Network, an explorative discussion about spirituality beyond mainstream religions. Hollis Taylor, author, psychic, astrologer, and alchemical mage, brings their non binary perspective together with fellow drag king and trans man Lacrosse Ortiz, a Jewish Taino with spiritual background of exploration that has led him to an atheist perspective. Join these guys as they explore deep and difficult topics, all related to spirituality, offering a queer perspective, an exploration of interesting topics, and engaging guests to help explore conversations for the rainbow soul. Hey. Um, Hi. Um, hey, everyone. We're so glad you're here to catch Rainbow Soul. Man, we are super excited about today. So I'm super excited and so happy and honored to have this very special guest. And first, let's start with with me today. I'm Hollis Taylor. In case you didn't know, I'm a I'm a witch. I'm a alchemical mage i'm a psychic and an author so if you want to check me out uh you can go to my website divineandrogen.com i do offer readings and have a book about being gender variants and how to implement that in your life in a good way especially from a spiritual perspective and this here is my buddy lacrosse hi everybody so good to be back it's like a week it seems like it's forever it's like a week goes by so so fast, but not fast enough when it comes to talking about this. Um, I'm LaCrosse Ortiz. Uh, I am a Jewish, Taino, atheist slash spiritual. Um, my whole thing is, is I don't believe that you have to believe in a supreme being to be spiritual. You can walk the path and use more accountability and responsibility in your journey. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much what I do. Oh, and you wow. can catch me on Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. I'm all over the place. <laughs> I don't miss his totally awesome LGBTQIA um, podcast, a storytelling podcast where you can hear stories of all kinds of very interesting LGBTQIA people. And um, today we are going, first I want to say this. If you're watching and you have a um, a dream that you want interpreted at the at the middle of the show, make sure you get it typed to me in the comments. Even if you type it up now, I can save it and then give it to Lacrosse so he can interpret it. And so be sure to if you have a dream that you want interpreted, that you put it in the in the chat for us right now. And I'll choose one and, and we'll feature it and um, and he'll do his best to help you yes. understand the messages from your divine self is what I think the dream is. Right. Um, so anyway, Lacrosse, why don't you tell us tell us about your uh, our, our really awesome guest today? OK, our guest today. Um, he is the chief of a tribe here in Lancaster. It's called Yucayeque Manicato. Um, it, the tribe started about seven years ago. Um, we, there's a museum here and he is the chief and the Bejique. Uh, Bejique is what we call our medicine people. So he has like double roles in this. So he's, he's got a lot on his plate, but please say hello. His name is Guatu Iri, Cacique Guatu Iri. So give a warm welcome. Hi. Hello everyone. Nice to be here. I'm very excited. Yes. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So we we get that you are sort of like the chief of the Taino tribe there, local in Pennsylvania. Is, is, is that is that true? Can you help me help us understand who you are? So the for some time, uh, well, it's a long story. <laughs> I'll try to give you a condensed version. For the longest time, I had been in the journey to find out about um our our Taino ancestry our nativeness and 
you know, the, the books tell you that we were extinct. Um, and so I always went around thinking there were no Tainos until Lacrosse calls me up one day and tells me, hey, there's this tribe in Lancaster. So dialing the years going further, about three years, um, you know, the, the as a group, we didn't have a place that we could call our own. So I had a vision of uh, getting a place where we could start having our own ceremonies and all that. Um, the elders of the of the tribe um, asked me to be the the uh, chief of the tribe, and you know, after about two or three times that they asked me, I finally said yes, and uh, I started to really dive into um, grasping as much as I possibly could because I knew that my first, you know, a as a being a chief of a tribe is being a servant and you serve your people and you take care of the needs of your people and you provide for your people. So I went on this journey to try to figure out, okay, what do we need to do? How do we need to do it? And hence the Taino Cultural Center came into existence. And I started rescuing artifacts that were being sold out there, uh, bringing them back to the people. I started to, we started to learn songs we started to learn, ceremony, um, learn ceremonies and uh, the history, culture, and that's really how this all began. And we've been there for five years, six years. I keep I lose track. Uh, yes, uh, because, uh, no, I think it's been longer. Probably is. Um, and we are the best kept secret in Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> that that's definitely true. I feel, I hear an echo. Is there an echo? A little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure bit. where that came from. I'm trying to think. Okay. Oh, that sounds better. <laughs> I think I had to move this. Oh. Yeah. So um, that's, that's how the story began. Right, right, right. And if we could elaborate now, I think a lot of people don't know a lot about the Taino because once again, we are considered oh. extinct within the the history books. Um, if you could explain, like from the beginning, who the Taino are, how they got there, um, and we can go into the conquest. So if you could give a little bit about the history. Well, our ancestors came from South America. They migrated through the Lesser Antilles until they got to the Greater Antilles, and they migrated as far as um, Jamaica, uh, uh, the Bahamas, they even uh, got as far as getting into Florida. So as they, they, the migration began, they went into different phases. Um, uh, and each phase that, mig that migrated brought along with it um, pottery and culture. Uh, in the beginnings, it wasn't as, as elaborate a society as when it really came into fruition when the Tainos, the Tainos came to be. And the Tainos were a very organized society. Um, hunter gatherers, they planted, they uh, lived in the mountains as well as in the coastal areas. So there was a lot of commerce going back and forth between the coastal and the, um, and the mountainous regions. They were also great travelers. They used to, they would have uh, canoes, which in Taino is canoa. They would have canoes that would that could house as many as two to 300 people on it. And they would take stuff and they would go into uh, Mayan territory and they would interact and, and exchange goods with the Mayans. And you know, you think of the ball game that they have, well, we have the same ball game, which is Batu. So I'm imagining that we adopted that from the Mayan culture. Um, so, so that's really how, how our story began until the 1400s when they came into contact with Christopher Columbus. And uh, of course we know what, what their intent was. Their intent was to uh, conquer and their sole interest was in gold. They had no interest in preserving society or culture. Um, they began to use the Tainos as slaves um, but the Tainos were not made for that. They weren't built for that. So um, eventually they brought in um, other slaves 
and uh, they pretty much uh, decimated the people. They didn't wipe it out because there were those who had that escaped into the mountainous areas. Um, I remember uh, when I had a conversation with my grandmother, and my grandmother, um, I said, hey, grandma, can you talk to me about the Thanos? And my grandma says, oh, we don't talk about that. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I want to know about it. So like she snickered and then she started telling me the story. She started telling the stories of when the Spaniards came and the, and the Thanos would run and the women would throw themselves off the cliffs with, with their babies because they didn't want to get captured because they knew the torture that was that they were going to um, endure at the hands of the um, Spaniards. So it was uh, the atrocities that happened were, were very bad. Um, but, you know, I... I tend not to like to dwell too much on that because I like to think about where we are now, that we've mm-hmm. persevered, we have been resilient, we are, you know, the, the um, resurgence started in the, in the 70s, 70s and 80s. That's when it really began, when we started coming out, we started, you know, uh, claiming our identity and claiming our heritage and claiming our culture and claiming our language, claiming our, our our art, um, and that's where, to me, the exciting part of the story is Columbus. Okay, I'm so done with Columbus, you know, yeah. that I don't even want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but what's going on now, which is right. really exciting, mm-hmm. is the resurgence and how people are becoming uh, getting an awareness, you know, and where you only knew of a, of a, of a couple of thousands. Now we've got thousands upon thousands of people who are claiming that nativeness that they have inside of them, it's calling to them, like it called to me over 30 years ago. So um, that's how it all began. There was a, a interesting point that um, I we had gotten all our DNAs done. I, I got my DNA done and I remember you had gotten your DNA done and to be able to get the DNA done and see like literally on paper, this validation of, because, a lot of times I think, you know, people want that, it, you know, they want to connect to that indigenous part of them, but it's scary when you don't have proof, when it's just hearsay and saying, oh, well, you know, we were Indians and our family was, you know, Indians from this part and that part. But when you can actually get your DNA done and see that validation of the culture and seeing, well, either it's over 14% or 13%, but it's there. And it's just a confirmation that our people are still there. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Like, I know if you could explain how, when you had your DNA done, how that worked for you. Well, I, um, I knew that, I I knew that there had to be something. Um, And, you know, it it was funny because we thought that it would be coming from my father's side of the family, because typically um, it does come from the side of the family. And the reason was because, um, most of the of the women were taken and they 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 mingled so so it, there were not many men left because they were they died during the slavery they were killed so, and 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 the more men they killed the less of a threat the Thainos became so they preserved the women and killed off as many men as they could so then the the, the DNA predominantly was coming through from the mother. But in our family, uh, it didn't come from my father. It came from my grandfather on my mother's side. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when, when I took my DNA, uh, I did my, my grandmother on my father's side, but my, my, we call her Guela. Her name was Guela. And she, her nativeness came from North America. So she, had a very, very low percentage of Taino DNA compared to me. And that blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, how can I have a bigger, she looks more native than I do. But come to find out that my great grandmother married a, an individual uh, who was um, uh, a transient person. And they knew that he was indigenous, and therefore that's where the indigenous DNA came through in our family. So we're kind of like an anomaly. Mm-hmm. The typically comes from the maternal. In our case, it came from the paternal. Right. right. 
that's that's, that's even though it came from my mom but it came from my grandfather not my grandmother right 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 and when when you start thinking um the the society as a whole like the tainos as a whole i know that it was a it's a major major focal community it was a, a matriarchal matriarchal community. right so, community uh it's not to say that the men didn't have uh the men didn't have value the men had value but um in those times it was the females that would nominate the cacique you had your your female elders and they would um they would say who who the the next chief was going to be and there's so many different stories that come back and forth you know so once one would say no it came this way and no it came that way and when I started reading the the, the chronicles, and I started reading uh, from the from the Rey uh, Bartolomé uh, de las Casas and um, uh, Ramón Pane, those are two friars that lived during that time and were were individuals that really noted and accounted for daily life in the Taínos. So that's how we were able to obtain a lot of our information is from those chronicles. So uh, a lot of people say, oh no, the, the, the chief comes from the, the uh, matriarchal part of the family or it comes from the sister, but well, that wasn't true. If there was no male heir that could take over the casicaso, which is the, the, um, the chiefdom, then the sister of the chief, would, if she had a son, that one would take over. So there were protocols that they had, but more predominantly the women um, had a, a large voice in what was said within the community. Right. And they were highly respected. You know, they, they, you know, they were taken care of, they were cared for, and everybody in any society had their roles. The men went out and hunted, um, you had potters, you had um, individuals that fished, um, so, so everybody had a function in the society, and everybody contributed to the good of the of the society. Right. I'd like. Uh, yeah, here I go, echoing again. Sorry. Um, if there's a way you could explain, um, there's something interesting that I always found interesting. A lot of the words that people use today don't realize they're Taino. Simple words and. If you could explain something on that part, like our everyday English language that we use or Spanish language, there are certain words that have come from us and people don't realize it came from the there's, Taino themselves. There's a lot of words that came from, <laughs> from our ancestors, from the Taino culture. You think of hurricane, um, huracan. Mm -hmm. So a hurricane didn't exist in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. There were no hurricanes down there, but they were in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. you know? so. Uh, canoes, canoa, hamaca, hammock. Mm -hmm. um, there's one that I, I remember, which was, uh, um, I think it was guagua. Yeah. yeah. And my, 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 we always knew guagua as a bus. Mm -hmm. But then we realized that guagua meant to them a mode of transportation where that housed many individuals. Yeah. And then later on, we learned in the Spanish to say guagua for a bus when we saw a bus, and then we adopted that name for what was a bus. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of words that come from, from that have enriched the, not even, not only the English language, but the Spanish as well. Yeah, yeah. like barbecue. 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 That's another one. That, yeah. In Taino, it's barbacoa. Right. So it's interesting to see how some of these things people don't know on every day that they are influences of the Taino people. Right. Um, that are still here today. So, um, so I guess moving forward, um, if you want to say, you know, you were talking about your journey and the, the Yucayeque, the tribe, um, if you could speak a little bit more on that. <clears throat> um, so, so the tribe came to be, and uh, we we stayed dormant for about three years um, because we wanted to learn, educate ourselves. We wanted the, that the moment that we opened up those doors, we could provide something that was of quality to the community 
and that we would have enough that we could really um, educate the public on the Baino culture. Right. So uh, after three years, we opened up our doors. We started doing full moon ceremonies every month to honor uh, uh, Mother Earth. And uh, we kept on introducing uh, art, uh, artifacts, instruments, uh, comics that were Taino influenced, uh, coins that were made with Taino uh, symbols on it. Uh, we have even playing cards. <laughs> so we, and, and, and many people will say, well, why, why, why is that in the museum? Well, the reason it's in the museum is because now you can see the influence that the Taino people had in our geographic location, but not only that, but in the Americas. When you talk about the Americas, you're not just talking about North America, you're talking about South America as well. You know, when people think about America, they think of the United States, but that's not America. America is the whole continent, the North and the South, that are is the Americas. Right. Well, uh, you gave me some. You gave me some some pictures, Lacrosse, and I, I want since we were just talking about the artifacts in the museum, I just thought we would bring some of these up, um, like this particular one. Uh, do, is there a name for that? This one would be represented of of a uh, of a, a shaman uh, that is in the sitting position and is in prayer. You know, uh, there are some that that if they have tear ducts that come down, they're similar, but the one with the tear ducts that comes down. So where you see the eyes, you would have some some tears coming. That would represent Buenael, which is the the spirit of rain. Mm. And then you would have Morahu, which is the spirit of the dry spell. And the reason they had those two spirits was because, you know, sometimes it rained too much. So they would have to say, okay, Buenael, we're gonna have to tie you up and we're gonna have to pray to the spirit of dry weather so that we can dry up the land and we can continue having good crops. Um, you're gonna see one that could be, uh, it's two vehicles sitting back to back. But when you look at them, one has is a, is a male and one is a female, right? And one of the things that was very uh, prevalent in the Taino culture was duality male and female. So when you see a, a figure like that, that one is saying that both exist. And then, you know, as we go further into uh, the aspects of a, of a behike, which is the, the spiritual leader of the community, um, there'll be some correlation between uh, the function of the behike being able to walk in both realms. Absolutely. Wow, that's really interesting. I think it's really special for people that are, you know, two spirit and and maybe like I'm not sure what this one is. This is a I know that these are... and this is the sacred chair of the of the chief. So whenever they went into ceremony, there were only two individuals that could sit in that in that seat, and that was the chief or the vehicle. And they would sit there when they were when they needed to commune with the uh, spirits, so that they could get answers to some, some possible questions that they may have, or so that they could journey and retrieve information from our ancestors. And they would sit on that duho doing a ritual, which is called the kohoba ritual. And the kohoba is uh, a mixture of the kohoba with tobacco. And they chew that, and that allows them to go into a hallucinogenic state so that they can talk to the ancestors 
to retrieve information. Do, do you know if it was um, if it was tobacco that they were chewing? Like, did they use any other substances? Like, I know like there's ayahuasca down in Central America. I don't know if they have that in Puerto Rico or not. No, it would. It was just a coba tree, tobacco, and they would chew on it so that they could. That that would be the the sacred herb that they would use. Wow. Okay. Cool. Now here's another picture. That's a mayoaca. Mm -hmm. So if you look in the center, you'll see a slit, right? It's like yeah. right in the center, there's a slit there. So there's two tongues. There's the the right and the left. And then when you hit one side, it has one tone. Hit the other side, it has another tone. Uh, the Mayuacan was considered, it, it was associated with, with the masculine aspects. And it was also associated with the frog of Puerto Rico. So the frog of Puerto Rico would go coqui, coqui, and when you hit the drum, you would hear tu tu, tu tu, tu yeah. tu, yeah. mimicking the frog from Puerto Rico. Oh, I love those frogs. Those frogs, like, I love it. I sleep so much better when there's croaky frogs around. I love them. They're all over Hawaii, Hawaii and Pacifica. Yeah, that okay. was, that's so funny because that wasn't supposed to happen. They took them over because there was a shift in Puerto Rico. And they and now over there, they're, they're a bother in, in Hawaii. They're like, we got to get rid of these frogs. Oh, are you kidding? Yeah. yeah. I love to hear them. I absolutely love to hear it. It's like yeah, but I think uh, I think they they hurt some of their native species. Hawaii is a very sensitive uh, environment yeah. uh, for yeah. an island. Um, I, I imagine Puerto country. Rico, Puerto, Puerto Rico might have been too, because gosh, gosh knows what uh, what what creatures we've lost, right? So oh, yeah. um, we've lost cultures, so I'm sure we've lost creatures too. So here's another. This looks like an instrument. That's maybe? a Mayuacan also, and the. Well, that's that's actually an, an art piece on the wall. It's made out of uh, bamboo, bambua, which is another Taino name, bambua. And the, the the figure that you see there is of the supreme being Atabe, the motherly figure, Mother Earth, the serpent mother. Uh, and when we do the full moon ceremony, we're celebrating the 28 day cycle of the full moon, which coincides with the 28 day menstrual cycle of the female. So yes, yeah, she's the, she birthed, she birthed creation. I think it was, she birthed it. Well, she, she, she birthed Yokahu, which is her son. She had twins. One was Yokahu, one was Guacar. And Wakar and Yukahu had different, uh, they had different responsibilities, they had different purpose. Yukahu created life, created the trees, created the birds, all of that. Wakar is kind of like the Lord of Destruction, but more, more, more with Wakar is he is the Lord of Hard Knocks. So when something isn't right, he comes in, tears it down so that it can be rebuilt again and rebuilt the correct way. The same way with lessons in life. If you didn't learn your lesson, a car comes and slaps you in the face, <laughs> sends you to the back of the line and says, let's see what happens when you get back up here again. <laughs> see if we're going to have to send you to the back of the line again because you haven't learned your lessons. Right. And that's really what Gokar does. Gokar is not a bad entity. And people try to look at it as a bad entity, but he's not. He has a purpose. Right, right. It's a Sounds a lot like, like a, Saturn. <laughs> yeah, it's like an adversary trying to teach you, you know, yeah. like a sparring partner. They're learn to duck or you're going to get hit. <laughs> hey, and sometimes, like, I, I mean, it reminded me when you were speaking of it, of Saturn in astrology, which kind of does the same thing. If you didn't, if you haven't dealt with things when it comes into play for your your astrology chart, Saturn is the one that where you're like, oh my god, or things start to happen if you didn't take care of them, you know, if you didn't listen to your heart. 
or whatever it was. So, all right, so let's go here. This is an interesting picture. So that is, uh, that really talks, is, is a picture that's at the center and it was created by my mentor. His name is Miguel Sagay and has been, he is the one who initiated, initiated me as a uh, Bahique. And uh, that art piece he started at the center. And if you look at the figure towards the right, to the right of the female, that is representative of Atabe. And when you look at her, she's always represented as as giving as as pregnant and re and ready to give birth. The same as the female that you see is like an earthly example of the femininity. The hoop that you see behind there, that hoop is called the koa, and it is also representative of Atabe, and it's the serpent mother. It's hard to see in that picture, but if you had a real koa, that those koas are made of uh, stone, and one piece of it is a head, and the other, and then it, you'll see that the tail is going into the mouth of the serpent. This also represents the uterus, and again, okay. you look at. The left, you see the sun. At the right, you see the moon, representing that the uh, the sun gives us light during the day. The moon gives us light at night. So the moon is called Karaya. Right. right. Wow, I think it's very interesting all of the different, how so many different paths can see things like kind of similarly, like like how the moon is feminine um, and represents, you know, sort of that. And um, I just, you know, the sacred feminine and the, even the, and the sacred masculine both. And um, so, you know, that, that makes me go, oh, what happened to everybody else? Um, that's not binary and I know they existed so can you tell us a little bit so they had they definitely had a lot of things to honor the divine the divine feminine um and they of course honored the divine masculine right we've seen right. some some tools and instruments that that represented that and and what about everybody else well now that you asked that question I can answer that <laughs> so Atabe is the, there's some there's this a entity a spirit called Yaya Guature. Yaya means spirit of spirit. Ture is the sky, all right? So Yaya is neither male nor female. And how does Yaya come to be? Well, Yaya is the emergence of Atabe and Yokahu together to create Yaya Guature. Then there's a term that's called Marokoti. Marokoti means neither, neither male nor female. So that would be that we're not binary. Then when you think about again, um, that would be the non-binary, basically the one who doesn't identify as either. There, you know, you have the ones that identify as one or the other, or one that I or the identifying as both, and then you have the one that identifies as neither. So it's almost like three genders, I guess. Or no, male, female, two spirit, and then none. So I guess that would be four, four representations of gender. Right. And when you think about the Mexicas, the Mexicas, when they're in ceremony, they, we have the, the ceremony that is more male driven, and we have the ceremony that's more female driven. And it's only because of the cycles and how they land that it, that it's done that way. But the Bejique is the only person that can do either role. So if there's no male Bejique to do the male part, a female can do it because that Bejique is considered to have both essence, the male and the female. So they can. So if a female is, is in a male ceremony, that female can take on the role of the male during the ceremony but they're the only ones that can do it because they are emulating both the male and the female. Right. 
and vice versa. Correct. Oh, wow, I keep that going bad. Yeah, That's try to get close to it. I think that might have something to do with it, LaCroft. I'm gonna see if you if get see close to your mic. My... <clears throat> Um, I was just thinking, okay. I was just thinking as you were saying that, like thinking about, you know, ceremony and indigenous tribes. And one of my favorite questions is, did they have a sweat lodge or something like a sweat lodge? Like, did they go into like a cave and pray or what did their rituals look like? They had what's called a condesi. So a lot of people would say, oh, well, they're in the Caribbean. Why would they want to do a sweat lodge? Well, the sweat lodge is predominantly so, because in, in the Thayan of you, the female goes through a normal purification process. Every month, their body cleanses itself out and they go through that process. Whereas they consider that the man doesn't have that. So, we, so we, the way that the man can is to go to the sweat lodge, which we call the Kanzi, so that they go in and they can get purified. We don't have that stigma where if a woman is in her cycle that she can't go into the Kanzi. We don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right. So it's so it's definitely a different type of... Now, the Kanzi, does it look similar to a sweat lodge? Like what? The Kanzi works very similar to a sweat lodge. There okay. are cycles that you go through. Uh, there, it's, there are differences with the Taino Kansi, uh, with prayers that are said, with songs that are saying, but it's pretty much you've got your stones, you've got your fire keeper, you've got the person who's pouring. So it's that same process happens. Okay. Okay. Did they have special ones for uh, the women? Many indigenous tribes had special ones for women to share the mysteries, and they sometimes would share with other tribes. They have what is called the new moon ceremony, which is only for the women. So as far as the Kansi, no, but they do, they do have a ceremony, which is a new moon ceremony, which is geared towards the women so that those, uh, what you just spoke of could happen. Yeah, they should, they would like, this is how, this is where the red tent movement kind of came from, tried to include everyone's perspective, but that's sort of what it's based on is that people kind of come together to share their wisdom right. about what it, the hormonal changes that happen naturally to people with ovaries. So there's also a story that we have uh, where when, when Wahayona, which was a chief who had stolen the women uh, and put all the women in this island called uh, Matinino, which is where the Amazonians came from. So these women came from uh, Maitinino, left the island and went to South America. Hence, that's where you get that story of the Amazonians. Yeah, I think I've, I've read a little bit about the Amazonian women um, just because I think it's fascinating. Um, that you know, in some cultures, women were oppressed. I hear that Taino didn't uh, oppress their women, but some cultures, even in some tribes, women were seen different. Um, but you know, I wonder about that, like what that was like for two spirit people. That you know, did they allow? Because the big question is like trans women being able to be in women's spaces. Um, and I wonder, did they allow the feminine people with a penis into those special circles that were just for women? Well, I think that back then, yes. But as colonialism impacted uh, and European mentality started impacting, uh, you saw that there was, uh, they were shamed into not doing it anymore. And after them being shamed, eventually they adopted it and thought that that shame was the, the shame, when in reality it was not. It was an imposed shame by the colonizers. Today, uh, we have adopted that. Uh, if you have somebody who identifies themselves 
as a male or a female, they can attend uh, 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 the ceremonies, you know, so that we're, we're welcoming and open to that. And actually, it never becomes, I know in our tribe, the UK Ekebanikato, it's never even a topic of conversation. It's like, oh, okay, great. Nice to have you. You know, and that's how we look at it. We don't really, I've always been uh, an individual, and I can only speak for myself that I see you. And that's all I see is you. And that's important when you go into a tribe because you you know, some people we they they come to this tribe for a safe space, you know, feeling, you know, because walking the two worlds, because we live in a society where it's so technically unacceptable, you know, um, because once you get like you said the colonized mentality it's nice to know that there are safe spaces out there where you can go and be the two spirit that that you were born you know or the maracoti whatever it is that you choose to be you know or what not choose to be but whatever it is that you have what you're called to be you know so well i <laughs> wanted to show this um comment here um so this person is saying that they didn't know anyone else knew about their culture. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and it sounds like they're very excited. So yeah. um, I, I'm glad that 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 you're reaching out and letting people know. And this person says, hello, hi, Tammy, <laughs> welcome. And our friend Sandy is here. Sandy loves to come and learn at Rainbow. So welcome, Sandy. Yeah. So, and, Fantastic. Well, I, I think that, you know, that the different indigenous cultures um, had a lot of different perspectives that are sort of crossed over. Some of the other things I notice are crossed over um, are not just gender stuff, but like um, the directions and the elements that go with it. Are your, do you know, like, are there elements with the directions? Do you, does Taino honor the elements in the direction? We, we have our directions are tied to, uh, we call them the cardinal points. So it's north, south, east, west. Actually, we start at the south yeah. because we're always looking to the south to our Caribbean, to the Caribbean, because that's where we came from. So we start at the south, then we move to the west, the north, and the east. Attached to those are colors. Attach and there we also have the sacred birds, and attached to each one of those points is the sacred foods. If you were to talk about stones, we have twenty-eight stones that represent the uh, the twenty-eight cycles of the moon. Um, as far as crystals or anything like that, I don't know that that they did or did not. Because there's a lot of information that's still missing, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Well, that's very interesting. It's okay. Uh, we're just having a discussion about the way um, the different like things that kind of cross over in a lot of tribes and um, and a lot of spiritual paths. Um, and so let's talk about like Puerto Rico's land mass. Like there's a volcano there, right? So they probably had a lot of different types of stones and, and, and things like that, right? Yes, yes, they do. So do and you know- do you... There's a lot of necklaces that are made of the stones. Uh, amul amulets are made of them. So yes, they, they do use them. We do use them. I think the whole point is, is we're, we're basically thinking like, what would be the representation of each of the points? Like I know the uh, the east is the the red tail hawk. I the, think. the south is the turkey. All right. The you know a lot of people think the turkey as a dumb animal, but it's not. It's a very intelligent animal. But the turkey be, it represents the freedom of the obstruction of prejudice and preconception. And when you think of that term, that's very powerful. Free from the destruction of prejudice and preconception. You know, and each cardinal point has a virtue that allows you to continue the cycle. 
you know, so that you constantly grow and you reach a point where when you hit, get to the, to the east, that is the representation of the red tail hawk, where now you can see past your own self. You can see with that far-sighted vision, you know, but it's like cycle. I think uh, the one thing I do remember learning was that they said the whole objective is to get to the middle where you have each of these elements, you know, like the north is is wisdom, the wait, the north is childlike, the you know, like a childlike mentality, the south is wisdom, old age, you know, seeing far, seeing near, within, and being able to get to a place in the middle where you are balanced in all these four areas. So sometimes having the, the, the totems or the birds help you. Re it's kind of like remembering, okay, this animal represents this. I got to remember to be humble. I got to remember to be like this. This animal represents that. And always trying to seek that balance. I mean, if I'm correct, because it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. It is true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's interesting I, because that, that actually shows up a lot in like um you know in witchcraft and um in a lot of other pagan spiritual paths um almost all and most of them are sort of celtic based uh like from ireland and stuff and we kind of have like the same thing certain animals represent certain things the directions usually represent the elements earth air fire water um but you know and and in that we um do try to get to the middle to balance all of those and that's the divine or uh, the divine within each of us or however we see the divine. I so think, like, I think, but you guys, you guys have numerous gods or is there one divine being and then numerous gods? You got well, it. I, I want to see if I can answer your question earlier a little bit clearer. When you talk about uh, the elements are come up in the stories. So when you talk about Baya Balakol, who was a shaman who had learned the secret of fire, fire comes up. Mm. When you talk about Atabe, the cosmic mother, but she's Mother Earth, the Earth comes up. So when you think of Yaya Guature, the sky, the sky comes up. Yeah, the air. air. Uh, when you think of uh, Buenayel, with the rain, the water, he comes up. So it doesn't really come up in the way we are used to seeing it. It comes up differently, but it's there. It's just not looked at the same way. So talking about um, the gods and the difference between gods and semis, I think it's an imperative that people know because sadly, when when the conquest happened they felt that the indigenous people um worshiped all these different gods and that was not anywhere near even close to the case so if you want to elaborate more on that well we have what's called semis and these semis these spirits allowed us to explain life and how it occurs. It also helped us to come up with our stories of creation. It helped us to explain different things. You think of the frog. The dinos were so complex that they understood the concept of a molecule through the frog because of all the eggs. So when they laid eggs, they knew that there was something even smaller, such as a molecule. And that's the only way I can explain it, is that they had these different beings that represented different things, these spirits that represented different things and explained things so that the community could have a better understanding of life in general and spirituality. Right. And you would think, because like, I mean, I, like, I know, like myself, I'd like to consider it more like a manifestation since they didn't always have words to, to say, okay, this is science or this is that, like, they didn't have the word molecule. 
So, but when you think about that and they had that concept and they understood the concept here, they had to create these ways of understanding. Although be it today, we may look at it primitive. It's just their way of expressing that manifestation on how they see it. So, yeah. And wouldn't it also be like, I mean, in my opinion, I, and maybe it's because I'm an environmentalist, maybe it's because I'm a witch, um, that the indigenous people, and I think this happens to a lot of modern day pagans, um, is that especially us that are from a, the white, you know, we're white, we don't really know what our culture is really, to be honest. Most of us don't really know. Some of us think we might know. And um, it's because we were, I think the tribes were trying to stay um, in harmony with nature. They believed that there was a balance um, between the human experience um, and even the divine experience and nature. And I think that's actually something that we've lost. Um, not only do we lose cultures and, and tribes, um, you know, uh, but we all, we mostly lost it to colonialism and Christianity. Uh, Christianity definitely, um, they did this to the Celts um, in Europe. And then they came over and started doing it to the indigenous tribes, um, essentially saying that we were wrong by harmonizing with nature because we were using like magic or um, whatever, um, whatever their prejudice was. And I, I just, I'm just saying that I think it, I, I'm sure Tain, the Taino culture was trying to live in harmony with that volcanic. I'm sure at some point that volcano erupted and uh, I know Hawaii's got its stories around the volcano. I'm sure you all have stories around your volcano, eh? Well, we have, uh, we have stories more about Huracan, the hurricanes, which were more of a worry to the Tainos than, than the, the volcano. Uh, and I'm sure maybe the tremors happened, like are happening in Puerto Rico this past year. They had hundreds of tremors uh, that occurred. Uh, but when you talk about being in a harmony with, with, with the earth, they, the Tainos only took what they needed and nothing more. They, it was, everything was for the community. And there was no concept of owning land or this is mine. And, and, and you know, it, everybody partook in the benefits of whatever the earth had to give. And they were very reverent in making sure that they were not wasteful. When you think about the, the manatee, which for the Thainos was, that's our sacred cow, you know? So when they when they took a manatee, not one bit of it was wasted. To even to the, even uh, the ribs, they made uh, ceremonial uh, spatulas, what they're called purging sticks, and they would make purging sticks out of the ribs, and they would use it in ceremony. You know, so it was always think be mindful of not taking too much. And also giving back. So if you take, you plan. One hundred percent. Good. Oh, okay. I was just yeah. about to say, and I think that that's something that all call, that in, the entire human race has lost, uh, regardless of what land you lived on. Uh, I think we've all lost that. And like uh, Tammy is saying is that the vibrations with nature, like I know that, I don't know if this is true for the Taino tribe, but I know that other tribes, when they, they didn't, when they started experimenting with medicine, the medicine people would tune into the vibrations of the plant. They would literally like sit there and meditate. And if you've ever done that before, um, that's actually an interesting experience because that's how they would receive information and then they would try the medicine or not. Um, you know, then they would decide what they wanted to do with said plants, especially if they didn't know what it was for. 
there's a story that we have where a person from one tribe miles away would go to a tree and they would whisper to that tree miles away would be the recipient where they'd be able to take that energy that was whispered to them and they'd be listening to the tree and get the message mm -hmm. so when you talk about energy and vibration the dinos were very in tune with that that, that just reminds me um the movie uh avatar yes was based on the conquest down there and if there if, if any i don't know if you've ever seen the movie avatar not the last airbender actually avatar the blue people in outer space um there's a point where they are all they connect to the trees and the trees are all interconnected it's like this big nervous system and it's so funny because there's so many so much information that we don't have about the Tainos, but that was one of the information they considered it like a nervous system they all interconnected through nature and like he was saying they would talk to the tree and the tree would carry that message to the next village that's like to even fathom that happening today is is unreal you know it's just unreal when you think about the sacred tree our sacred tree is a saber tree yeah the saber tree you know that's our sacred tree mm -hmm. and and until today it's our sacred tree and and and, and we protect it because mm -hmm. it means so much to our culture you know the only time you can make anything out of a saber tree is if it falls on its own mm -hmm. you know and when that piece is made that piece becomes sacred yeah that much is true that much that much i've, I've definitely heard and there it's like actually illegal to cut it down yeah you can't cut the same you cannot tree cut a tree down a saber tree in puerto rico it is illegal yeah the other sacred tree is, is the cojoba tree yeah the cojoba tree yeah that's beautiful so, that's beautiful and that's what that's exactly what i'm talking about here um you know here's a person if you hug a tree during a thunderstorm you can actually feel it kind of throbbing <laughs> yeah. that's true i don't know if i'd do that i'd be too scared to get electrocuted <laughs> I said, that would be my luck. It gets struck by lightning. That would be my luck. I, I'm kind of with you across. I kind of go in. And yeah, that's, that's the yeah. stuff that's happening. We're going to take a quick break. This is so much fun. When we come back, um, if I don't have a dream in the chat room. I have a dream for you across. Oh, that boy. I had just the other day. Totally okay. funny and crazy and weird. And I think you I think you were a character in it, Lacrosse. So anyway. Oh no. <laughs> um anyway, so here we go. Um we're gonna take a little break. All right. WLFE-DB Radio has LGBTQ shows like Across the Pond, Rainbow Soul, Everything Yet Nothing, and Inside the Drag Closet. Check out the schedule on WLFE-DB.com. You can even watch them on TV at WLFE-DB.com under LGBTQ Friends right off our website. Again, it's WLFE-DB.com for your LGBTQ shows and more. WLFD-DB.com, where talk radio is a whole lot better. Our shows are your shows, and that there makes for a great talk radio. Oh, that was quick. Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back. I need some more commercials. I need one from your show next. Oh, yeah, I got to make one. I've been so <laughs> slacking on that. I have been just slacking. I know it's a lot of work, but you, you I, can put yourself one together and I'm trying to put one together for candy burning plenty. Oh, uh, nice. you know, we'll get there. We'll get hmm. there. I was on smoke break. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, thank, I think it's beautiful. The whole, uh, you know, internet thing because people can have their smoke or their drink or whatever. I know. Right. We're, 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 well, it's happening. And it, it no longer interrupts us. Um, 
So I think it's totally awesome. Um, <laughs> so here's, here's the weird dream I had. Okay. It's totally weird. I woke up in a little bit of like, a, Oh my fucking God. Like I woke up, I was frustrated. Okay. And the reason I was frustrated is because so first I was supposed to be going to some sort of special event, um, that you're supposed to, you know, get dressed up for. And, uh, I couldn't find something. Um, so I'm not really sure why, like if it wouldn't fit me or if there was just not enough choices, I'm not sure why, but I couldn't find something that fit me. So I ended up choosing Batman pajamas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, a Batman top and a Batman pants. And they were like totally like, um, you know, like Marvel comic pajamas, like for an eight year old. Like under and they were big enough for me. They were big enough for me. And so here I am and I'm at this place and everybody's getting ready. And I think one of the characters was you. And you were like, yeah, look, I, I got this outfit. And I was like, oh, that's <laughs> awesome. And you had this great suit on. It was like, it was like not quite purple. It was like this really awesome color you had a great shirt on and i was like oh man i don't know about what i got you guys i want to show you what it is and so then i'm like looking all over and i can't find what i just got what i the the batman pajamas i can't find them and i can't find them i can't find them i can't find them and then finally somebody says i think you're wearing the pants and i look down and i am i'm wearing the pants but then I can't find the shirt, which I just had. And then mm -hmm. I am looking for the shirt and I can't find it and I get mad and I wake up. So I'm okay. glad I woke up because, <laughs> because, you I mad about this <laughs> because I couldn't find stupid ass Batman pajamas. But were you wearing a shirt? Yeah, I was wearing a shirt, but I was going to try okay. it on and show everybody. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. What's a special event? Um, let me yeah, see. Yeah, you know. Like a dance or something like that. It was some sort of right. special event. Um, really, like the special event doesn't stand out as much to me. But I know you did recently have an anniversary. I did. I did. So, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that could just be like residue. You know, it could be residue. But um, what stands out is like you you were wearing the PJs, the PJ pajamas, and I think that has a lot to do with your inner child. Just going back to that inner child. You know, because here I am with this suit on and you're like, oh, my God, that's so great. But, you know, but I got this, you know, <laughs> and then just the frustration of, of of knowing, OK, I had this and now it's gone. Sometimes we battle with it. You know, we have that inner child, but we'll lose it, you know, and we'll just have pieces of that inner child or that innocence in us. And then it is frustrating and you do get angry because sometimes we don't like being grown up. Sometimes we don't like the adult life. And to me, I just get that that's just you like still holding on real hard to that inner child and that that innocence and that that purity that you just so desperately want to hold on to. And sometimes you lose it. And I think you get frustrated or you get angry because you don't want to lose any of that. You want to hold on to that. I mean, that's that's what I'm getting from the dream. You know, I think it has something to do with the hormone trends, the hormone uh problem that i'm having the it, hormones it could, are it, out of whack i was sick too so i was not that feeling could be good it. that could be it but i and mean I was, that's and that's, it's that's, very frustrating to me the whole right, thing is frustrating right yeah i mean but like i said since they were under ruse it's like that's the first well like pajamas like that's the first thing i get is that inner child like where you see kids but they got the coolest pajamas we don't but you know, that's that's basically what I get from it is just holding on to that inner child. Yeah, so. it's, I imagine it probably had something I do because I do feel like I'm aging and that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. My hormonal aging experience uh, is what's happening to me right now, but I, I can't change it and it's frustrating. Um, yeah. So I do feel like I'm losing a piece of myself. So I think I think you've got it there. See, I knew if I brought it to you, you'd be able to help me <laughs> figure that out. Completely crazy Batman pajamas. <laughs> I've been having what? crazy dreams myself. So, I, but I think I know a lot of people who've been having crazy dreams and like suffering from a lot of like headaches and things. Like I don't know what's going on with the moon or what's going on yeah. with with the solar system, but like. Well, like even myself, I've been having crazy dream, lots of headaches, 
lots of agitation, you know. I wonder, I wonder about your astrology chart immediately. So what's actually happening right now is that Pluto went retrograde a little bit ago. Okay. Uh, so Pluto, the last time Pluto went retrograde, we got COVID. Mm. Um, so Pluto rarely does this, uh, but it's happening again right now. And it will be going on, I think, until the fall. And <sighs> right now, everybody experiencing computer problems and tech problems is because Mercury is in shadow and will be mm. there until the end of June. Oh. So uh, that has a lot to do with it. Astrology uh, is a beautiful way of looking at the stars. Hey, we should bring our guest back on because yep. I'm wondering, I'm sure that I, you know, uh, looked at the stars. Oh, I'm yes. Sure they looked at the stars. All right. Welcome back. Welcome Thank back. You. Thank you. So we brought up the stars. I'm sure Tainu Tribes, they had to look up at the sky, right? Yes, they had they, to see their beautiful stars. Absolutely. But uh, I was having computer problems today. <laughs> it's so funny that he, now, when she why. mentioned that, I thought about you right away. I was like, oh, now I know why this thing wasn't working. <laughs> but yes, they 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 uh, they looked very much at the stars. They understood. Um, they were able to tell the seasons from the stars. They looked at the moon, uh, at the sun. They looked at the Pleiades constellation. They looked at the Milky Way, and they were very aware of it. They used it for navigating. Right, they were, they were able to navigate the oceans with following the stars. So, and in fact, our ceremonies are driven based on seasons. Yeah, yeah. Right. I just like yeah, all the others. Yeah. During this, well, speaking of the traveling, um, since they did like they were considered pretty much the explorers because they. Like there has been stories about them getting as far up as New York. I think they had found some petroglyphs in a cave up in New York that were actually Taino from what I had heard. And also down south, there were certain tribes that considered the Taino's cousins. You know, so I I don't know. Like they, they were really, they didn't just hit Maya, but I had heard that they had gotten as far as Georgia, Florida, even as far up north as New York. Now, I don't know how the petroglyphs got there because they didn't just trade wares, they trade well, they marriage, intermarriage. They had petroglyphs in Georgia. And mm -hmm. so they actually found petroglyphs in Georgia. Um, my, my assumption of that is that there probably was very small migration, maybe individuals that married into other tribes and brought part of their their uh, artwork or their pottery, and that's where it became existent. I don't know that they traveled as a as a as a group all the way up there, but I'm sure that you know as they interacted with the Mayan culture, they acted with the the culture in Florida. Those individuals probably did create pieces that they left there, um, and I think that that's as, as much of the influence that I see happening with the Taino culture. Right. Um, I, when I was in New Orleans, I had spoken, I had spoke to someone there and they had said that the Taino were actually, because they call Louisiana the tip of the Caribbean. And they said there was actually even Taino influence there because I because they were talking about some of the indigenous tribes that were there. And I asked them, you know, since it's so close, you know, and they're like, oh no, we're the tip of the Caribbean. And I said, well, do you feel that there was some influence? And they're like, a hundred percent. I am sure that they, they they were sure that there was influence of Taino culture there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were pretty interesting explorers. So that's why going with the the stars. Well, I mean, how about in Central America, like Costa Rica, Venezuela? Mexico? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, predominantly, uh, most likely, the biggest influence was uh, where we came from, which was Argentina, Venezuela. You know, uh, you even find Colombia, those areas where, you know, they, they migrated and it was a path that they followed all the way up. Um, it was funny because there was this huge debate about deer. 
oh, that's not Taino. We don't have deers. And then lo and behold, we dig into the archives and we find deers. Wow. So it wasn't such a Northern thing. My guess is that they probably brought them down. Um, mm -hmm. Did you know that there's deer in Puerto Rico? No. Yes, there's deer. I had no idea. Yeah. That's fascinating. But That's again, fascinating. We, we, you know, we don't understand that. Uh, we, we think about migration and we think it in terms of today. No, but that migration was happening back then, you know, and people were interacting. You know, we found the tooth of a jaguar in Puerto Rico. We know there's no jaguars in Puerto Rico. How did the jaguar tooth get there? Oh, it got through trade and commerce. Yeah, that's fascinating. Maybe from a place like uh, the Tico culture in Co Costa Rica, because mm -hmm. um, there are some things that I've learned about just from going to Costa Rica so many years. Um, you start to learn about the Tico, you know, culture there, um, and you know, jaguars not unusual there and i'm just like you know thinking about the distance from puerto rico to costa rica pretty darn close uh i can't i could totally see them going back and forth and trading and cooperating and uh maybe even coming from there i could see that you know costa rica's right there yeah. so and it and i and uh puerto rico is kind of a um jungle type of uh island right in the in, in, have a in the time yes in the time yes it, it was very mountainous a lot of trees densely uh with uh vegetation um so i would definitely say that that it would mimic the jungle i yeah, mean we do have a rainforest yeah i mean there's a rainforest there that's still also heavily protected um el yunque so that that makes sense that it would be very very dense yeah because costa rica is all right ours too yeah. yeah so i'm sure that they had a lot in common or or even related in some way like cousins or something so yeah so i i mean um but let's talk about what's going on today like with the with puerto rico what's it i mean they're now it's a bit of a city right and well, the city is the city and the country is still the country. <laughs> when you think about the mountainous areas, uh, you know, uh, as we continue, um, I had stated that a lot of uh, people from the island are reaching out to their indigenous roots and, um, and inquiring more about it. You know, uh, there's this group that's called Taino 101. And in that group, they have about, I would say, over 7,000 followers. And there's another one that's called Taino Education. And every day I'm seeing somebody else pop in there. Oh, I just found out. I want to know. I want to learn. Can you guide me? Can you show me? Can you teach me? What books should I read? Um, and, and I find it very intriguing that it's like uh, even after 500 years, we, you just can't wipe it out of us. You know, as, as hard as, as, the colonizers tried to do that. They weren't able to stifle us and take our identity away. And I think it's a, a, a struggle. It's a long, long battle still yet. I mean, we still have a huge battle on trying to get, like I said, get written back in the history books for them to stop stating that we're extinct. Um, getting, getting some, not so much recognition, but at least validation and understanding that we still are here. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest, biggest struggle that, that we, we are having because they're still not acknowledging that the Tainos exist, at least. But I did, the last census, they did, I think there was a lot more people writing in that they were Taino this last time at, and before it wasn't, was, wasn't in there. So enough people writing it in is going to force them to have to start acknowledging that the Tainos still exist. Mm -hmm you know so but they get which, in, they, they kind of they get caught up with the argument of well you're not flu but full-blooded taino no i am a descendant right and that's all you need to know is right. that i am a descendant of 
Bam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to say, who's they? Who says that Taino doesn't exist? Is that I like like this, like educational book? It's 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 how the history has been written. Because remember that history is written by the conqueror. They decide how the history is going to be formulated. Mm -hmm. So the conquerors wrote us out of the books. Um, Columbus was glorified. Uh, but people don't realize that he was the Hitler of the 1400s, mm -hmm. you know? And who would want to give accolades to an individual who created so many atrocities or was the catalyst for so many, uh, extin the extinction of so many cultures, you know? So uh, I think until people get to the point where they really want to hear the truth is when people will start realizing that they've been fed lies. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. the truth hurts. And I think that's, so, that's yeah. that constant battle that we got to keep, we just got to keep pushing, just got to keep pushing it. You guys have a cultural center there, right? In Lancaster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. What happens there? What do you do? What happens? I know there's a museum there, right? Well, um, we have uh, gone to schools, participated in uh, educational pieces. We've gone to colleges. We've, uh, we do something that's called Atabe 360, where every month we would go out and clean the streets. Um, actually, the street is named, uh, we've adopted the street. So you'll see the name of the, of the uh, tribe uh, at the end of, of the street, Yucayeke uh, Manicato. Um, we are high on teaching people the truth, you know, and the beauty of our culture and how uh, you think of the Tainos and how much of an influence they had in the world, you know. So we do spend time teaching. We do our ceremonies there uh, pre-COVID. We used to do it every month. After COVID, we had to shut it down, but um, we're at the verge of reopening again, starting our ceremonies, um, and just really uh, educating people. That's a key. Now, how, how can somebody, if they want to join or learn more or come come be part of a ritual, how can they how can they get in touch? Well, they uh, they can go to the Facebook page, Yukayeke Manikato, and they can go in there and they uh, ask the administrator there. He uh, his name is Rafi Torres, and he will uh, make appointments for people to go and see. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can type it. Well, lacrosse type it. Type it. Is that dot com lacrosse? No, it's on Facebook. That's how it's it's shown on Facebook. Oh, okay. So they can like do pound with that word. Yeah. Okay. So let me try to put that up here. Okay. So All they right. can go to Facebook. They can go in there, and they'll get accepted. And then they, if they want to have a tour, they just set it up with the Takina of our tribe, and the Takina mm -hmm. is the voice of our tribe. He will um, do his very best to set up a day where uh, he can open up the doors and let them go in, and he'll give them a personal tour himself. Mm -hmm. And he's very informative on all, like on, on most, not all, but on most of the matters. <clears throat> there we go. There we go. Yep, that's it. So, yeah, and uh, you guys have a museum there with some educational things. So, like, if someone had a class or a group or something like that, that was uh, majority, you know, um, from Puerto Rican people, Taino, Puerto Rican people, uh, would that, that you would take a small group, right? Like a small class? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've done that before. Uh, we have videos that we place. We have a, a, a monitor that uh, we show videos, uh, educational pieces. We have the artifacts that uh, that uh, 
have little cards that explain what that artifact is, where it came from, um, artwork, um, anything that has influence of the that has Taino influence on uh, today is uh, we we put it in there. Mm. A lot of artwork. A lot of artwork. Yeah, a lot of artwork. Okay, and let me just spell that out loud for those just listening to the audio stream. It's pound. Uh, you could just search on Facebook for this. Um, you could just type in in the search Y U K A Y E K E M A N I C A P O. So you could type that in and then you can get connected and send a message and reach out, you know, yeah. because uh, I think harvesting our cultures is one of the best things you could do. So what about people that are like me that are allies that, you know, we're not, I'm, I don't think I'm from Puerto Rico, although sometimes I wonder, um, cause I'm constantly like, I grew up in a neighborhood with a, a large uh, population of people, Puerto right. Rico. And then I went to Standing Rock and camped right next to the Taino tribe and lacrosse is my drag. And I'm like, wow, hmm, why Taino keeps coming up in my world, but, um, but anyway, what can we do to help for allies? What can what can we do? Well, they are called Datiaos. And a Datiao is some deity that gets adopted into the Taino culture. So we have Datiaos in our tribe that are 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 that we consider brothers and sisters. But the one thing that I wanted to uh, clarify is that being a Taino is not just Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. It's Haitian. It's Cuban. It's Dominican. It's Jamaican. It's from Bahamas. It's mm -hmm. from Bermuda. It's uh, Bermuda. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Aruba. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times Aruba is never spoken of, but I've been there numerous times and I see the artwork and stuff like that. In fact, one of my... Um, I had a bracelet that has the design of the cardinal points made from the caves in Aruba. So it expands quite a lot. You know, when you talk about Taino in general, there's a lot of different islands that uh, become a part of that. So, you know, if anybody's listening, you know, we've used the term Puerto Ricans quite a few times, but I want them to understand that it's Dominicans, it's Cubans, it's Haitians, it's Jamaicans, it's all of that area. Right, right. We just happen to be the whole Caribbean area. Yes. That whole, right. Right. Including, I don't know if that would include Costa Rica or not, because uh, I definitely hung out on the on the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. I felt very much at home. Yeah. I'm it's sure there were influences. I'm sure there yeah. were influences. No, definitely. Sorry, adjusting the headphones. They're hurting a little bit. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like I just like to talk about um, what people, you know, why it's important for people to harvest the culture because I I definitely am bothered. Um, my experience at Standing Rock um, practically made me cry. I talked about it last week. Um, it just it did make me cry. It made me uh it made my heart break right there as I listened to this young person describe how they didn't have a culture, how they didn't know where they were from, they didn't know the history of their culture because it was erased. Um and uh I find that so the then people like Candy Brings Plenty uh, and you and that is it seems like there's a huge movement to bring it forward to bring the culture forward but do what about cultural appropriation because that is also a thing where it's kind of like where blm starts, starts talking about white privilege it's a privilege where i think to be honest with you, I think white people have lost our culture and we we fail to see that. Um, and then as a result, we cling on to anything that looks cool that passes by. Mm -hmm. um, so we're like, oh, yeah. And 
then um, because we are resonating, are resonating with, um, with you know the the ideas of being connected to nature, of having divine feminine, and honoring all genders, and having you know rituals and and spiritual perspectives. And I think that that kind of creates a little bit of cultural appropriation. Do you guys? How do you feel about that cultural appropriation? If you know what I'm talking about, where I think you made a very interesting statement that you lost who you were. And the other part of that statement, I think, would be, and you created what you are now. You know, Europeans had have indigenous people. They have an indigenous background. Um, I think the, the disconnect is the passion to want to dig into your roots, listening to that internal DNA of yours and trying to find out what is it that that's resonating. You know, we've, um, you know, it, it's, it's when I think of, uh, you, you talk about the Celtics a very, very rich culture and very indigenous people. And, you know, uh, nobody talks about that. You know, I'm sure that if you look at different cultures, there are indigenous people, but nobody speaks of it. And, and I don't know why it resonates so much in us that we fight to regain that. It's important to us. If you don't know where you came from, how can you know who you are? That's tough, you know? And and I didn't know where I came from in the sense of, I didn't know about my uh, dainoness, but I knew there was something in me that just, just was dying to find out. It was, I was very um, uneasy and frustrated because every time I try to open a door, it just seemed like the door was locked. And I kept on trying doors and I kept on trying doors until eventually I found that door that opened. And I walked in and I shut the door behind me and I continued that search because it's so rich to me, you know? Um, it's funny because I just finished a paper on gender and cultural diversity. And what's very interesting about that is that people who have been oppressed or under, who have experienced racial uh, discrimination have learned to have a, a different quality of, of empathy and sympathy. I'm not saying that uh, non-minorities don't have it, but it resonates so much in them because they're always looking back at what happened so that they don't do it to anybody else. Mm -hmm. You know, so they don't forget that. And I think it's the same thing as with culture. You look back to see, okay, what did I learn? You know, I, I my grandmother, um, always planting outside, digging with the dirt. And my grandmother says, you know, I love plants. I just love plants. I love the dirt. I love the earth, you know? And I told you earlier that that's what I spent yesterday doing, <laughs> is connecting to the earth, connecting to the things that I have learned from my, my grandparents and the stories that I heard from my grandparents. And, you know, you never realize it, but year later, years later that kicks in. And you start saying, man, if I could have talked to her even more, learn more from her. How great would that have been, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, yes, and I've thought of that often, that comment, that, that statement that you made, I think about that often. I was like, wow, what about their nativeness? What about mm -hmm. their past? What about their culture, you know? And I, I think to interject here, I think the reason, because we're talking about cultural appropriation, I said, I, I think the reason to draw is because of the lack of that connection because sadly a lot of europeans lost that connection to the earth and i think they 
they they latch on to indigenous people or indigenous ways because they want to reconnect to that earth. So I don't know. I think cultural appropriation comes in is when it's not respected. And when a person will take on a culture that is not their own and will not do it with honor and respect. And I think that's the biggest problem. It's not so because the truth is, is back hundreds of years ago, they would have adopted in somebody who wasn't born there. They would have adopted them into the tribe. That wouldn't have been considered cultural appropriation back then. That would have, you would have became a sibling. You're a part of the family now. And I think that's the difference is that there's a difference between you saying, I resonate with that, but I don't want to offend. You would only offend if you didn't do it justice and if you didn't speak and use your privilege to help the underprivileged, if that makes any sense, you know, but I, I, I think cultural inappropriation is like the battles we're doing with now, you know, people using indigenous people like tomorrow, I'm going for that thing to make sure they don't, they take this, this mascot off. We're not mascots, we are people. And I think that's where, where the difference is, you know, as long as you go in with respect and you honor and, you know, you don't have to be flamboyant about it, you know, but if somebody's willing to teach you and you're willing to learn and you can pass that on, you're just making a better world, at least in my opinion. I mean, like the modern two spirit uh, identity. Um, some people have even called me two spirit uh, in the pagan community, and I'm like, no, I didn't. I wasn't raised on a reservation. I'm not indigenous. Um, I'm just a white person. I so I. That's why I named my own path. That's right. why I did that divine androgyny. Um, because for me, the alchemy makes sense to me. Um, and alchemy probably did come from like Europe somewhere, maybe Spain or something. Um, but, you know, I think that what I noticed is that the indigenous cultures also want to be celebrated and held. So like my partner, uh, is an African drummer and has African stories and, and has even been to Africa. Um, and that culture at the time when they reached out to African Americans at the time, they weren't interested. Uh, so when a white person stepped up and said, well, I am, then they taught whoever was interested. Yeah. Um, and and I I think, I'm like, so now is she supposed to just not carry that on? I say, no, she needs to carry that on uh, because it's kind of her job now. Right, right, <laughs> right. It's funny because the same thing happened to us because, uh, you know, we were born here in the States. So, so we are considered individuals that had no country because we weren't accepted by the Puerto Ricans from the island because we weren't born there. You know, it's funny because I, I was with a gentleman um, and we were going through the mountains of Otuado in Puerto Rico. And he started talking and, and, and putting out sayings that he didn't think I knew. Next thing you know, I'm sitting down here, hey, do you know this thing? Yeah. And then, oh, how about this one? You know that one? Yeah, I know that one too. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did you know this? I said, because my parents taught me. And just because I didn't come from the island doesn't mean I don't feel like I'm from the island. I am from the island. You know, I was not born here and I was raised all my life in the United States. But I learned everything. You know, and he's like, yep, you, you are Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were considered, like I said, the people who didn't belong to the United States and we didn't belong in Puerto Rico. So we were considered to be in limbo. Mm -hmm. And feel somewhat still because we're technically not, we're, we're uh, Puerto Rico is a, it's a territory. It's not a state. So it's a, it's owned by the United States, but it's not a state of the United States. If that makes, that's why we're saying we have no country. So we conquered it. So the Americans conquered it. Why don't they just let y'all have your island? Right. <laughs> you know, and I think that's the whole point. This is like, and when you're born here, 
it's hard to be accepted from over there. But then even here, we're not accepted because we're from over there or our ancestors are from over there. So it's this double-edged sword, you know, and, and, and it, it just doesn't make any sense sometimes. And what are you going to do? I know as a, as a white person, I'm going to share this because I believe in truth speaking as I was raised in a neighborhood that was uh, very racially split. There was definitely a black area and a white Polish area and a Puerto Rican area. And there was definitely racial BS that went on about Puerto Rican people as well as people of color. It didn't matter They, you know, they used mean words. Um, I was often told to stay away, uh, that it was, uh, uh, that they were bad people somehow. Um, I wasn't very good at listening and no one really supervised me. So um, I definitely was exposed to, I would, uh, I didn't have any parents. So I just kind of would get adopted by families because uh, no one was around to really watch me. So I would just like hang out with my friend and then go home with them for dinner. And the next thing you know, the mama was feeding me um, and, and even wondering, if my mom cared what time I came home, um, you know, those kinds of questions, like, does it matter what time you go home? Don't you need to be home by dark? And oh, nobody yeah. cares, you know? And, yeah. and the next thing I know, I had a family that cared. Um, yeah. And that was how I grew up. Um, and I often ended up in homes that were rather low income. Um, that sometimes probably had too many people in the house, you know, eight, 10 people in a two bedroom house. Um, and I was just one more. Um, and so it was very interesting to me to be in a fairly middle class white family, yet spending most of my time with fairly low income uh, families that were more open and present and loving to me than my own middle class class family. Um, and frankly, there were numerous Puerto Rican families that took me in and loved me just the way I was, it didn't matter what color my skin was and several black families too. So I, I you know, uh, but I will say that I had to keep it a secret. So as a white person, as a white kid, I had to not tell my stepdad. Now my mom wasn't racist, but my stepdad was. Um, and I also had another caregiver that was quite racist. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it does really exist, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Is mm -hmm. anyone out there that's questioning if this really exists? It really exists. It's, it's quite uh, obnoxious. And, oh, yeah. and white people know it exists because they hear each other speaking it. It's just that there's this silence. We're not really sure what to say. Oh, and um, I, my advice on that is if you're a white person and somebody says something that you're like, Puerto Rican people are just people and you want to say that to them, but you don't know what to say, you know, your racist uncle, um, <laughs> you can instead say, I know some people that are Puerto Rican that are not yeah. that. And I think that you are making assumptions that are inappropriate. And you can just say that and leave it at that. You don't have to get into a big fight. You could yeah. just say that. So I'm going to say as a white, as a white anti-racist um, activist, uh, for equality for all people, uh, that now, if you've watched this show, you can say, I have, I know for a fact that that's not true. Right. I'm sure um, that there are some people that suffer, um, that are in trouble with the law and things like that, but there are just as many white people that are in trouble with the law as there are Puerto Rican people and black people. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Most and, of us just want to pay our bills and live in peace and yeah. love. Each other. It's I so funny because. Uh, go ahead. I remember one time somebody asked me, I said, so what's your nationality? American. <laughs> no, no, your nationality. American. You know what I mean? No. Are you asking me about my heritage? Oh, I'm Puerto Rican. Really? You don't act like one. So my, my next statement was, well, tell me how to act so I can get it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, it's, it's just uh, ignorance on people's point, but there's always a way to educate people and, and do it in such a way that they walk away thinking hmm. and really contemplating what they just did or what they just said. I was gonna let Hollis know that's kind of like the whole like big family thing. Like it, there's uh, this joke after three kids, what's one more, what's five more, you know, when you have so many children and we are used to living with big families, you know, and there is a beauty that comes with that, uh, uh, a sharing, a love, you know, uh, looking out for each other you know there's something that comes with having a big family and like me i only have i only had my four kids next thing you know this one kid moved in i didn't even know he moved in i go upstairs and i said whose trash bags are these and they're like oh that belongs to chris and i'm like when the hell did chris move in nobody even told me the kids li the kids been with me for like 10 years he moved in when he was like eight nine years old and i'm like I can't believe this. So I've been I've been taking care of this kid for 10 years, you know, and then at this point, you know, I got hooked up with my wife and now here's another kid. It's just another kid. It's just when you have so many. Yeah, just keep them coming on as long as they do the dishes. That's what we care about, you know. Well, going back to uh, to what um, what you had stated earlier about they, they were hospitable to you. They took you in and that's how our grandmother raised us. Yeah. My grandmother, it was about hospitality. It was about giving the best of what you have to whomever walked in that door. I remember my grandmother would make this big pot of rice. The grandma told us, oh, but you never know somebody's gonna come over. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather have a little bit of extra food just in case somebody comes over. Yeah. It definitely yeah. was hospitality. The, it's interesting that you say that because now as an adult i'm kind of like that i'll make extra food and if extra people like my brother is visiting colorado and i was like yeah come on over yeah bring your wife's family sure it is like seven people <laughs> and I'm like okay you know like i'm kind of laid back about it because that's how i was treated um you know by numerous families and they they just welcomed me in and just and i definitely did that too as a parent if my son brought somebody home i just treated them like they were my kid i, I so, yeah, quick, there was a quick story that uh Guatu and i we were in puerto rico and this just goes to show the difference of the mindset of here and of over there, um, I was eating somebody. I mean, eating somebody. I was eating something. I wasn't eating somebody. I'm not a carib. Anyway, I was eating something. Um, and somebody had told me, buen provecho, you know, like to your health. And I immediately, immediately like, what the hell? What are, what are you trying to say something to me? You know, you go back into that, like real defensive. And and he's like, hey, hey, no, no, he, he really meant that. And I'm like, wow, how humbling, how humbling that was this isn't just about Taino's Puerto Rico or the, this is about a way of life that has been passed down from generation to generation. It's just, you know, and the Taino's were that way, passing it from generation to generation to generation. You treat people with hospitality. You treat, you give them from you. And no better story than the king or the, the cacique that gave his crown to Columbus and should look at the mentality that he thought, oh, you're crowning me, the king. And he was like, no, I'm just giving you what's mine and sharing that. And that's something that should be taken from the Taino, you know, like like something to take away from them, that they were 
not called the noble people for nothing. So I just had this. That has, put that it, it, it's interesting because when I stayed at Standing Rock, you know, we totally arrived at night. We had just driven down the red road. It's really intense in North Dakota, okay? It's North, the Dakotas are a weird place to drive in. It just seems to go on forever. It's like mm. Kansas. Um, but anyway, when we finally got to Standing Rock, we drove down this road that was nothing but tribes, flags up. And we just pulled over and parked in a spot for the night. And the next morning we got up and I was trying to, I, I'm kind of the, usually the camp chef and I'm trying to set up food. I'm not feeling real good. And I go over to the porta pots and who am I camping next to? But the Taino tribe, right? right? And so this guy introduces himself and he's like, hey there, how are you? Checking in. Did you guys just arrive? You guys must, I, I didn't see the fan here last night. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, is it okay? And he's like, oh yeah. And then he's like, do you need help setting up camp? Do you need help setting stuff up? I see there's three of you. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't feel too good. So he was like willing to like come help me set up my kitchen and you know, because we're all camp out there. And that just goes to show that even today, um, and at Standing Rock, that was kind of the vibration, but I was clearly a white person right. that had just shown up at Standing Rock. And the Standing Rock movement was an amazing thing because that's the first time those many, that many tribes mm -hmm. were in one place in a cooperative way. Right. And they were praying to save the water. Mm -hmm. The water protectors were absolutely moving. So I just wanna say that your tribe was so definitely honored there mm -hmm. and they were part of it just like everyone else. That's beautiful. And you were seen, you are loved just the way you are. So just, I just want you to know that, 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 that although some of our culture may not honor your tribe and I'm happy to help harvest all of the cultural beauty of the tribe. Mm -hmm. I think that there's beauty in, in all of these cultures that have been left and I want to see you harvest your cultural ways. So as we close, is there anything else that we needed to address? I, you guys have a two spirit. Uh, you, you guys, you guys use the two spirit because most indigenous tribes use two spirits. Does Taino use two spirits too? Yes, they use the two spirits. Uh, but like in any, you know, you have those that are very accepting, and then those that would have that colonized mentality. And, but I'm sure that happens with a lot of different tribes, not just us with our, you know. But uh, I can say that we are very um, open, inclusive, and uh, we just look at the individual who's walking through that door and that's it. I think we touched pretty much everything. Did we get I to touch so. it? I think so. If there's anything we missed, we can always revisit real quick. And so now I'm shuffling the cards as we've been just saying our, our ending comments. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm using a deck called Love is Love. And it is a GLBTQIA uh, collaborative deck, which very much aligns with me personally, because I love to collaborate with people. I love to do things, uh, it's the Libra in me. Um, so anyway, and so each one of these cards is a different GLBTQI artist. And so I'll be showing them to you. This, this reading right now is for everybody watching and anybody watching, even if you're watching the rerun, this is for you too. If you hear something that vibrates for you, that resonates in your world, now, just because I say it, if it doesn't feel like it's for you, it's okay, no big deal. Just, just let it go. Um, but take, take what you like and leave the rest. It's one of my favorite sayings from the Twelve Step Program. Um, and so, the first, the, the first card, you know, is reminding us of something in the future. 
And this is actually a really interesting card. I've stumbled across this card once before. Um, it's a very non-binary person laying there with their dog, which actually kind of, kind of reminds me of me, um, uh, just kind of chilling and connecting with nature. So I think this card really, but they've forgotten about one of the swords and swords in tarot always represent um, thoughts uh, or beliefs, okay? And so be aware of that one thought that maybe you forgot about from the past, especially. And one of the things that is reverberating out of this, resonating out of this card would be that in the past, you remember when COVID first started and, and all of us were like, oh, the animals are awakening mm. and all these wonderful things started happening on the planet. And somehow, miraculously, Mother Nature was coming back. It felt like Mother Nature was waking up. I don't know if you got to read that news, but if you didn't check it out, what happened at the beginning of COVID to Mother Nature. And be aware of her resilience. And that's what this card is to remind you of that feeling. Remind you of that feeling right now, because right now... <laughs> my favorite card it has three drag queens on it um and clearly uh even even racially uh different and the beautiful part is up above them is they are actually pentacles which are considered um like gifts or could also represent money like you know good things or things that you receive and also up there are the planets so it's astrology, which is a gift in itself. And this is a six of pentacles, which is very much a celebration of the divine. So right now, the, the cards are telling us to take what you learned in the beginning and take that forward. Because each and every one of us has a gift for the world. And we all know that it probably is in honoring nature in harvesting our connection to nature. Our cultures, our indigenous cultures are connected to nature. That's what this is all about. That's what astrology is all about. And when you look up in the sky, remember how small you are, but also remember your inner divinity, your inner power, your inner drag queen, your inner drag king, when you can step on stage and own the stage. I know Lacrosse knows exactly how that feels. All of us have a way that we can step on stage. What is that? Bring it to the world right now because we need you, because we need to save the earth. We need to all come together, bring our cultures back, especially the ones that harvested our connection with, our connection with nature and this. This is a beautiful card. The Four of Wands has two people of color, a person of color, and a, a I, I would say an interracial couple of some sort, probably a queer couple of some sort. And to me, this always looks like a trans woman and maybe uh, a trans masculine person or a non binary person. And so for me, that always reminds me of the beauty of being queer that you never have to be in a box, be who you are. Don't feel like you have to do what everyone else is doing. And instead, do it the way you wanna do it because that's what these two people here are doing, right? They're celebrating their love. And that's what we're all about to do. We're all, as human, as the human race, we are all about to bring our gifts forward, collaborate with who you need to collaborate with, Step forward and be ready. Be ready to embrace the gifts that are on their way that look like the Four of Wands is usually a celebration of collaborative collaborations like um, either networking or even couples. Um, can you imagine if you could have a beautiful, like, you know, Taino wedding, right? And all, uh, uh, that honors the new ways and the old ways. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and so that's what the beauty of this card is honoring of all the different ways that the world resonates for all of us. So 
I want to say that together, these three cards are indicating very important, beautiful message, which is simple, yet direct, is that we have come a long way. Remember your connection to the earth. And if you if you have a gift, bring it. You Everyone has a gift. Bring your gift because your gift, whether it connects people, whether it directly heals the planet, some even like lacrosse's uh, show, a kaleidoscope eyes where he celebrates all queer people. That beautiful storytelling helps us understand each other. Understanding brings peace. So whatever it is that you have to bring to the world, bring it because the collaborations are waiting for you. The next gift is waiting for you, whatever that is. And as we evolve as a human race, the world is bound to get better, especially if we start harvesting each other's cultures and giving each other room to be exactly who you are, just the way you are, just the way you were made. You are perfectly imperfect. And that's who you're supposed to be. And I'm glad you're here. So I want to say to all of the queer people out there, regardless of the color of your skin, the culture that you come from, or whatever it is, whatever keeps you being different, even if you're just a weirdo like me, hey, <laughs> stop. You are perfectly imperfect. Take a look at your astrology chart. You were made this way. It's an interesting thing. So... That's what I wanted to say. And if anyone else has any cult any closing comments before we go, any messages for everyone? We got people thanking us. Um, Esper Esperanzi, thank you for the wisdom. Thank you, Esperanzi, for always watching the show. Appreciate you, my friend. And Sandy Griffith um, has really enjoyed the whole show. And uh, Bright Hawk is a, has enjoyed the conversation. and. We're so glad. Any any other closing comments from either of you? Oh, no, I think we've covered You go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. And, uh, you know, and I think that uh, as the world turns, we continue to evolve. And, and I have faith that humanity will become a better sense of itself. Absolutely. Be the best that you can be. Exactly. 100%. Well, thank you for coming on the show, even though, yes, I forced you. Um, <laughs> I forced you. Um, but thank you so much because I think our culture, people need to know more. And if, if the more we educate, the more people will learn and hopefully start keep shifting, keep shifting and changing. And there go the motorcycles again. So, <laughs> well, thank you both for bringing Thank your you, Alice. Thank you. Because I think it's, I'm just going to say it's fucking important. And I'm yes. using fucking to accentuate that <laughs> it is important. It's important. Yes. Uh, and I want people to know it. So I'm so glad to bring you on the, to have you both uh, with your beautiful wisdom. Thank you. Thank so you. Good. Thank you for watching Rainbow Soul part of the WLFE DB Network, a queer perspective on spirituality beyond religion. We appreciate you sharing the show on your timeline, follow us on social media of your choice, and join our Facebook group, Rainbow Soul. We want to hear from you. Share your topic ideas for Hollis and Lacrosse. Explore upcoming shows and interesting guests. The Rainbow Soul Facebook group where we build community of questioning seekers. Rainbow Soul, where spirituality is our medicine. WLFE-DB Radio has LGBTQ shows like Across the Pond, Rainbow Soul, Everything Yet Nothing, and Inside the Drag Closet. Check out the schedule on WLFE-DB.com.
You can even watch them on TV at WLFE-DB.com under LGBTQ Friends right off our website. Again, it's WLFE-DB.com for your LGBTQ shows and more. WLFD-DB.com, where talk radio is a whole lot better. Our shows are your shows, and that there makes for a great talk radio.